Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, the last time I was in Israel was when I was beginning my graduate studies with Mark Feldman at Stanford. And, um, and I wanted to thank Adi Livnat for inviting me. And, uh, and it's wonderful to see so many familiar faces. And for that, I can thank the Simons Institute in Berkeley and also Mark Feldman for helping to create this uh, wonderful theoreti theoretical community for evolutionary studies. So today I'm talking about interpretability and incomprehensibility in the products of evolution. So organisms have millions to trillions of parts of whose combined activities emerge replicating structures that behave so as to maintain their organization. That's our best understanding of what living things are. But the, they're the basic open questions are how does organismal structure and function emerge when considered at the full scale of organismal complexity? And how does evolution shape the functional and structural architecture of organisms? These are two principal open questions that, uh, that I'm interested in. So in the past few years, artificial neural networks have been created which, where the behavior is not constructed but actually also emerges from the dynamics of millions of interacting parts, or thousands up to millions of interacting parts. And now the behaviors rival certain cognitive capabilities of human beings for the first time. And so we now have this a second example of complex systems with emergent properties analogous to what living things do. And so the question I'm wondering is what might be transferable between these domains? So, um, one of the uh, current challenges of deep learning networks is that their behavior can often be impossible to explain or understand or interpret. And that they can also produce unwanted surprises in their behavior, being fooled, uh, finding loopholes, vul vulnerability to adversarial examples. And so how can you trust systems you don't understand, can't interpret, and can't explain? Um, so this, this question of interpretable, understandable, explainable AI, these are all now major research efforts. So the question is, why shouldn't the same phenomena be found in biology? And here I examine the genotype-phenotype map through this lens of interpretability. And so we're going to go through a catalog of processes that enhance or obscure the interpretability of biological processes. And the take-home lesson that I wish to offer is that the degree of interpretability may be the product of the underlying processes and not some inherent feature of organisms or life or biology or chemistry, but a, should be thought of as a result of processes. So here is a, a great classical example um, from Carl Sims, uh, Artificial Evolution for Computer Graphics. So he actually created a, a system for generating images, and he did uh, artificial selection. He picked the images he liked, and then had a system of, modif of mutating them, and, and then continued to do selection, and he came up with this great uh, image. Uh, sort of looks like ice, icicles or something like that. And um, so, uh, and it was, the, the system that generated it was genetic programming. And in genetic programming, you have, you can represent a function as a parse tree. So here's the Gaussian distribution represented as a tree. And you can take two of them, uh, and you can take parts of them and recombine them, and you come up with a new formula. And that's actually the, the system that you, a variation and the underlying you know, genotype that created that image he, that uh, I just showed. And here is the code that generates this image. All right, it's in uh, Lisp. And if you were to ask how, how does this create this image, it really uh, is impossible to explain. So, and this is something that Sims noticed early on. He said, users usually stop attempting to understand why each expression generates each image. And so you have this system. This, is, this genotype is generating an image. Carl Sims is selecting on the image, and you come up with this. And how this maps to this is completely obscure. And yet, this is what he liked, and this is what he got. So in nature, 
you have something, you have the, in the case of the peacock's tail, which I notice is on one of the posters for the conference, you have the peahen uh, evidently selecting on the pattern generated by the peacock's genome. And the question is, are we going to run into the same problem? So are we going to, is the genome, uh, the, the genetic coding for this peacock's tail going to be something like this that's completely incomprehensible, or is it going to be interpretable and understandable? And uh, as far as I know, there, nobody, nobody knows the genetics of the peacock's tail as of, as of now. So it's, that's an open empirical question. So uh, in other examples of evolutionary computation, uh, so which is now applied to all sorts of things, uh, if you've ever flown on a Boeing 777, the original engine for that was produced by an evolutionary algorithm. Um, here they, they tried to get a nozzle that would uh, do a fine spray of paint and they started out this and they evolved uh, the shape of it and they ended up with the, the, this as the, the final shape. And there's no, the, why does this produce such a, gr a great uh, uh, um, spray of particles? Who knows? Here's another example of trying to evolve wires into a, in, an effective antenna. And it was the same thing. It was done uh, in, a, in a computer and then uh, built. And it, this is the shape that was the best for the antenna. Why does this work so well? Who can say? So these are examples of products of an evolutionary dynamic that are not interpretable, understandable, or explainable as to why they work so well. And here's an example of, from a, a dissertation uh, of a student uh, at San Diego who was trying to uh, use genetic programming to produce code for an autonomous vehicle. And the student actually has the code in the appendix of the dissertation. And there's page after page after page after page of this code and uh, that works, that drives the autonomous vehicle perfectly well. But the question is, would you get into a car that was driven by this code? So again, as a product of evolution, this is not interpretable. And so uh, for generating uh, you know, artificial intelligent agents that we put trust in, uh, it's a problem because how do you trust something like this? So um, a folk psychological definition of these terms, which I'm using fairly interchangeably, I'm sure there's, there, they have different usages in the literature but interpretability, understandability, explainability uh, is essentially having some kind of hierarchical decomposability, if you will. And there's actually an interesting paper by Wolfson et al., Have Your Spaghetti and Eat It Too, Evolutionary Algorithmics and Post-Evolutionary Analysis, where they're trying to take some of these evolved uh, uh, genetic programming code and uh, find uh, some kind of way of interpreting what is doing what in the code, and it's, uh, it's of mixed success. So it's also a, a, a question that arises in evolutionary computation. Now, the molecular biology program, who's a molecular biologist in the audience? A few of you, okay, so you tell me if this, if this rings true or not, but that the, the whole paradigm of molecular biology has been that one attempts to hierarchically decompose the phenomenon, um, because that means you understand it, and then understanding is necessary to achieve prediction and control. So um, there was a, a, a seminar at the, at the Santa Fe Institute, and this, this guy gave this talk of this very complicated model, and Murray Gellman was in the audience, and I feel sorry for the guy, because at the end of his talk, Murray Gellman said, what is the point of studying a complex system we don't understand by making a complex computer model that we don't understand? And I thought, oh my God, what a devastating critique. But in retrospect, uh, in this era of deep learning networks, I would say that understanding isn't everything. And that a computer model can be incomprehensible, but accurate, and thus allow prediction and control, manipulation and intervention. So what about an AI system? If it seems to work, but we don't understand it, should we trust it? So here's an example uh, a, of some deep learning systems that seems to be interpretable, 
And in this example of a convolutional deep learning network, you have these different layers that seem to, the activations of the different neurons in the layers seem to be uh, attributable to different properties that we can recognize of the, of the inputs uh, after they're trained. Uh, but in other cases, um, uh, the general question of how do the particular weights in a trained deep learning network generate the correct behavior? Well, this is, people are not even, at least the last time I checked, not even attempting to say why do these particular weights generate this function? Rather, the current explanation is that is the process that produces the weights, the stochastic gradient descent, is how you explain its behavior. But there are some surprises, these adversarial examples. Now, uh, in uh, yesterday's talk, there was, uh, people showed the example of the two pigs. Who, who saw the tip picture of the two pigs? So one of them had this imperceptible imperceptible noise added to it. It looks just like the same exact pig, and yet the deep learning network says instead of it's a pig, that it's an airplane. So this is the, this is the exact sign of complementary uh, adversarial example, where, uh, so this paper, Nguyen et al., what they, they, they wanted to do was they wanted to take these off-the-shelf um, deep learning networks that have been trained to recognize different images and see if, if you evolved a, a pattern that would be classified by the network as a certain, like a penguin, would it look like a penguin? And so they actually took an evolutionary approach and evolved uh, pixels uh, to be highly classified by the, by the pre-trained networks as various different animals. And what they found was, so this was 99.6% certainty the network thought this was a robin, thought this was a cheetah, thought that was an armadillo, a lesser, lesser panda, a centipede, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so, and to our eyes, it looks completely like static. So this is an example of a false positive where the network thinks for sure that that is a jackfruit, um, but to our eyes, it's obviously not. So the whole vulnerability to adversarial examples is an area that's still trying to be understood um, in uh, deep learning networks. So um, we don't quite really, we can't really fully explain how they're working. Now, so what I would like to propose is the following, that biological phenomena range over a spectrum of interpretability and that different levels of interpretability are primarily the result of different evolutionary processes and that biology has advanced primarily by working its way from the bottom of the ladder of interpre interpretability upward, and that modern techniques may be propelling us into bi biological phenomena that may be intrinsically incomprehensible, in that they can't be hierarchically decomposed, and that we need to be ready for that possibility. So here, let's go up this ladder. Uh, so from some of the earliest discoveries, the lac operon. This wonderful feedback system of regulating the production of, lac, of lactase um, that had a had a that was easily I would say fairly readily understood and explained. You can explain and understand and interpret what all of these parts are doing. Now um, we get it to a little bit more difficult in a more recent phenomenon of RNA folding and uh, the structure of RNA. And we get into a little bit uh, even more complicated with trying to understand development. So here is an example of some circuitry, uh, developmental circuitry of a dynamic system that produces these stripe, the segment determination in Drosophila. And these days we get into uh, these connectomes, interactomes, and this is an example of a, um, the protein uh, interactome from, this was from 2006, and here it is seven years later, and we're getting these hair, what are called hairballs, and the question is, uh, how do you interpret or understand or explain 
how these things are producing the organism. And what I'm proposing is that something like this may be inherently understandable, but when we get to a certain level, we may be encountering phenomena that, that can't be hierarchically decomposed and that really can't be understood any better than why do the particular values of weights on a neural network allow it to play a go better than any human. So I want to go through a small catalog of processes that would seem to confound interpretability in the products of evolution and then go through a catalog of processes that promote interpretability. So the catalog includes the, the things that confound interpretability, infinitesimal pleiotropic gene effects, and defensive complexity and constructive neutral evolution. And then on the other side, processes that promote interpretability, dimension reduction from dissipative dynamics, and mechanisms that select for modularity. And then in particular, um, the area that I contributed to is how gene origin dynamics contribute to modularity and possible interpret interpretability of the genotype phenotype map. So let's first go through in processes that contribute towards incomprehensibility. So the basic, what's called the infinitesimal model of quantitative genetics is that genetic variation at many loci have very small magnitude of effects over many traits. And this has been uh, empirically uh, uh, developed recently by Boyle, Pritchard, and company, and they're what they call the omnigenic model. And so the idea is that many parts participate in often unmeasurable degrees in generating many traits, and such a system will not be hierarchically decomposable. That is how it works will not be interpretable. So as a, a little uh, kind of visual metaphor, uh, this is a photograph of a remote uh, road on the island of Maui where I used to live. And when you go out on this road, it looks like there's thousands and thousands of potholes that have been repaired over, over decades. Um, that, that's how it looks. So the idea is a metaphor for, the, for this infinitesimal model is that uh, a gene comes along and patches a, a little particular pothole here, but it generates a slightly smaller pothole somewhere else. And then another gene will patch that pothole, but it'll leave a smaller pothole somewhere else. And so what you have is that uh, tens, hundreds of genes collectively uh, pat patch each other's potholes and make a smooth, navigable road. But that uh, trying to understand how a particular gene is contributing, uh, causing this to be a, a drivable road is, is no longer, you can't de decompose it into anything. So, uh, so in fact, the main, the main model of quantitative genetics has this property. A second idea, really interesting, uh, that I learned about at the Simons Institute meeting uh, where I first met uh, Adi and uh, Leslie Valiant is uh, Eric Chastain and company, uh, a model of the immune system, which is to say the immune, why, you know, why is the immune, when you look at the immune system, here's a little example of uh, showing the dynamics of the immune system. There's all these different types of cells, and all these different cytokines uh, interacting with each other, and it seems to be unnecessarily complex. And what they propose in this paper is that it's actually defensive complexity, that it's evolving to a, a point of complexity to thwart uh, pathogens from being able to evade the immune system, uh, to be able to figure out how to get around it. So this is an interesting idea and in which the complexity is actually a kind of uh, encryption, if you will. And um, another, a third idea is what's called constructive neutral evolution a term introduced by Arlen Stolzfus, that among all the genetic encodings of a particular phenotype, the more complicated ones may outnumber the simple ones. And so if you have, if the different encodings are mutationally connected by neutral networks, uh, which is to say a, um, a mutation happens which pre preserves the phenotype, and so it, um, there's no selection against it, then over evolution, the more numerous complicated ones will predominate. And so this is basically an entropic process on neutral networks and exemplifying what McShay and Brandon have called biology's first law, which is a kind of increase in 
entropy. So here's a, a particular example, uh, which is this example of scrambled genes, which is uh, these ciliates have these bizarre, these bizarre genes that are all, so here's the sequence on the genome, but when you look at how the, the, trans, the transcript, which is, the, and then the, poly, the polypeptide that is finally produced from it is topologically mapped to this, it's all chopped up in little in pieces. And the hypothesis here is that the ciliate evolved some way so that once there was a, an inversion on this gene and it evolved a way of, unscram of putting it back into the right order, but once it had that mechanism, it kept getting more and more scrambled and every time it was able to unscramble it. And since there's many more possibilities of having a scrambled uh, ordering than a, than a single linear ordering, uh, it simply evolved into this uh, scrambled gene uh, um, configuration where there's, there's no fitness advantage under, uh, and it's not, it's not there for any function whatsoever. It's just that there's more ways of doing it this way than there are of that way. So that's this constructive neutral evolution is another thing that leads to incomprehensibility. And this idea actually was first developed in the field of genetic programming and, uh, and from a 1997 paper. So what was discovered in, in this method of genetic programming where you have a, a tree that is a, uh, that a par that's a parse tree of a particular piece of code and you're doing these subtree exchanges is that when they actually applied selection to these things that they, the average length of the tree would get longer and longer and longer and longer as the number of generations proceeded. And it was a mystery, it's called bloat. And it's a problem because then you spend a lot of time uh, computing things that are actually completely useless uh, for the actual computation that the tree is doing. So um, one, of the, one of the proposals is from Langdon and Poli that in general, variable length allows many more long representations of a given solution than short ones of the same solution. Thus, in the absence of a parsimony bias, we expect longer representations to occur more often. And so representation length tends to tend to increase. So that again is an entropic process on the space of equivalent solutions of a, pro of a process, of a, of a problem. And you simply move into the more probable regions of the space where, there's, where the programs are longer. So that's a little bit of a, of a gallery of processes that contribute towards uninterpretability, incomprehensibility. Now let's look at the opposite direction, processes that, that uh, contribute to interpretability. So one of them is dimension reduction. So um, the, the many-to-one property of genotype-phenotype maps may reflect something mathematically fundamental about the composition of natural functions. So, in fact, dimension reduction is a generic property of infinite dimensional dissipative dynamical systems. So, uh, you may have what's called the uh, embedding space, it may be ha very high dimensional, but your, 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 your sample, your sample distribution may actually fall along a much lower dimensional subspace of that. And here, here's an example um, uh, from the early days of dimension reduction algorithms. So here, um, these are, each of these images is really uh, 4,000 dimensional image data, but um, in this paper by Tenenbaum et al., they, uh, the actual, so the, that's the embedding dimension, but the actual variation was really just along two dimensions. So one was, uh, was closing or opening the fingers, at, oh, actually that's, uh, let's see here, yes, that's this dimension. The other is rotation of the wrist, okay, and uh, so there's really only two dimensions of variation here embedded in this 4,000 dimensional space, and their algorithm was able to actually properly embed it into a two-dimensional space. So um, we find, uh, here's an example of an infinite dimensional dynamical system, a, prob a, a partial differential equation, and 
even though um, the dimensions are infinite, when you look at the uh, global attractors of these infinite dimensional dynamical systems, they are typically finite dimensional. And you actually have this nice theorem which says how uh, th this, um, this lambda parameter, so it has a, a, a nice diffusion term and its change in time is equal to this diffusion plus this, this function which has certain regularity conditions and the, uh, the dimensionality of the attractor is bounded by lambda to a power. Okay, so um, once, once you have regularity conditions on this function, you get an infinite dimensional dynamical system gives you a finite dimensional attractor. So, and this is a very generic property. So, um, uh, so it's a, a hypothesis that would seem to be reasonable is that organisms, the actual space of their multidimensional phenotypes is really a low dimensional subspace of the, what you, of all the different variables you look at when you see the organism. And that this will uh, contribute towards interpretability. Now, the second phenomena is the evolution of evolvability. So, the early works on um, the, this question, um, so the, generated, the generation of adaptive heritable phenotypic variation, okay, is a way of describing evolvability because if all you're generating is deleterious variation, the, the evolutionary process will reach a mutation selection balance and stop. And so adaptive evolution requires the, some production of phenotypic variation that's in the adaptive direction. So the question is how can you randomly alter a complex organism and improve its function with non-vanishing magnitude at non-vanishing probability? So a general answer is by diverse mechanisms that focus variation in directions with adaptive opportunity while suppressing variation in harmful directions. So here um, a, a general way of quantifying these ideas is the, this concept of the distribution of fitness effects of mutation uh, or other kinds of variation operators. So here we have growth rates, fitnesses along this axis and probabilities along this axis and if, you're, if you have the exact same fitness as your parent, then you, 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 the offspring maps here. So all of this, all of these, um, this region all is deleterious mutation. All the weight at this neutral line, that's, that's uh, mutational robustness, if you will. These are mutations that have no effect on fitness. And then evolvability comes up from this upper tail of the fitness distribution. So we can then take this, this distribution of fitness effects and map it to these classical concepts of genetic load, the more recent concepts of mutational robustness and evolvability. And uh, so that was for a particular, um, a partic that was for the yeast uh, heat shock protein, 90, and we seem to see this very generic behavior uh, from other proteins, uh, other genetic variation. So here is for an E. coli beta lactamase. And again, you see a mode at neutral evolution, then a large chunk at deleterious, and then th this little spike at lethal mutation. So it's typically bimodal. And then this small upper tail of the fitness distribution that refl reflects evolvability, the, evolvability, the ability to actually improve on the phenotype. So if we go back to a classical model of, of Ronald Fisher, what's called the geometric model, where you, basically you, you have a space, a phenotype space, and these uh, spheres are your, your contours of equal fitness, and evolution then simply uh, random variation moves you towards the center of the sphere, and if you look at the fraction of, uh, ver of the variation that's an improvement, that, fr that fraction, that upper tail, only goes down as adaptation proceeds. So how can evolvability ever evolve to increase? So clearly it can't in this simple model. 
So uh, there's a variety of, of evolutionary mechanisms that have been identified that actually produce the, an increase in the evolution of the upper tail of the fitness distribution. So in, typically these models have a recurring variation in natural selection. So it changes from one selecting from one phenotype to another phenotype and back and forth. And you can think of that as that alternating selection tends to wear trails, as it were, and that the genotype evolves to places where it can quickly evolve with a very small number of mutations between the, the selective peaks. So um, uh, I should mention uh, this uh, Kashtana Elan um, at, at Weizmann and um, uh, so one of the pioneers on this, and um, so here's uh, a, a depiction of this model. So you have, these are two neutral networks. B, so these are all the same phenotype A and phenotype B, and if you keep selecting, alternating between selecting for phenotype A and then for phenotype B, the genome will evolve to a point where it's poised between these two networks, where a simple mutation can get it to switch from one phenotype to the next. And so that's evolution dynamics. So this will tend to, to, to then, whatever those genes are that allow the quick change between these two phenotypes, then you can interpret that they are the gene controlling the phenotypes. So that this tends to lend itself towards more interpretability of the genotype phenotype map. And here is the, the paper from Kashtan and Elan. And um, so they, they looked when you had constant selection, you get, a, you get an uninterpretable genotype phenotype map, but when you switch between what they call modularly varying goals, then you get to the situation where just changing the connections on a, of a couple of these, uh, of these gates will allow you to switch between the two different Boolean functions you're selecting for. And here it's a general open question is what mathematical properties of the fitness landscapes allow re-evolvability re to evolve under recurring variation in natural selection. Here's another paper, um, very interesting one, uh, by Jeff Kloon and company, where they suppose that there's actually a, a fitness cost to every connection between the objects, between the items, and this selects for having lower connectivity, more sparse networks, but what they find is that the actually sparser networks have higher evolvability and, and so in this and, and faster adaptation. So this is a really interesting outcome. Here's another example um, by Tamar Friedlander who is at um, Hebrew University in Rehovot and uh, she, that she worked with Uri Ulan on and other authors. And so it's imagine a gene regular uh, or a, a um, uh, a signal processing network which has inputs and outputs and where your input space has different ranks of variation and what they find is that um, under an evolutionary dynamic when you have a low rank in your variation of your input space you end up with a low rank uh, a, a very s a small number of vertices in the middle so that um, and that as you increase the rank, you get the, the number of internal vertices tends to match the rank of the inputs. And um, so this allows you, so it's not just a, a completely connected network that evolves out of these processes. You get a relationship between the, the, the variation of the inputs and the structure of the network, which, allow, which then could, you could say is inter, gives you more interpretability. And here is Adi's contribution, uh, which is the idea of mixability. And that, uh, and I hope I represent this uh, adequately, that sexual reproduction and recombination cause alleles to mix with other, the other alleles at the same locus and with the genetic variation in the rest of the genome. And this selects for alleles that have high mixability with the standing genetic variation and modularity in the phenotypic effects of allelic variation contributes to mixability and is therefore selected for. And um, so this then uh, gives you a, also a more interpretable genotype phenotype map with this modularity. And as mentioned in a previous talk, this is where um, Srivastava 
And Hinton and company got the idea for the technique of dropout in deep neural network training. So now I want to come to the, the particular area that I've worked on, which is how gene origin, the or dynamics of gene origin, contributes to mo a more interpretable genotype-phenotype map. So a basic idea is that genes have two fundamental properties. So we're, we're used to the idea of the generative properties. How does the gene product actually, how is it employed to generate the organism? But there's another aspect, which is the variational property of the gene, which is how does variation in the gene map to variation in the phenotype of the organism? So genes not only provide materials for the organism, they also provide degrees of freedom for varying the organism. And um, so selection on the incorporation of genes in the genome therefore selects on the dimensions of variation in the genome. So here I want to use an analogy to help understand what the consequence of that is um, from World War II. So this was a, a, a the, the, the Royal Air Force uh, bombers in World War II were having high attrition at the, at the hands of the German anti-aircraft artillery. And so they did a study of the one of the uh, when the airplanes came back from from their missions of where the holes were from the artillery, and because they figured they could add some extra armor to try to reduce the attrition of the airplanes, and so they looked at the distribution of the holes on the airplane, and um, so they were going to uh, recommend that they put armor where they where the highest density of the holes were. But one of the, the fellows working on the team was Abraham Wald, and he wrote a paper and he did a statistical analysis and he said, no, 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 that would be exactly the wrong thing. You need to put the armor where there aren't any holes. He said, the reason there's no holes there isn't because they're not being shot there, it's because the planes that get shot there never made it back, all right? So that was his insight. So the planes that got shot here, you never counted them among the returning from the mission because they never return. And so the analogy then is in the genome, uh, so the, the sampled planes, they were all very special. They were the ones that survived. And in the same way, the genes functioning in the genome are very special. They are the ones that survived. And so their histories are conditioned on a small choice of common events, that when they were created, whoops, when they were created, they subsequently reached high frequencies in the population due to selective advantage or drift. And the new sequence was preserved uh, because deletion or loss of the function uh, would be deleterious, okay? So the genes that you look at in the genome have these as conditions on, on their presence. And so we can ask them, what are the missing holes in the genome? And so some of the missing holes, the things that you don't see among the genes in the genome are disturbing functions that under stabilizing selection, for example, dosage, and um, uh, having basically just being neutral additions, that those will be hit by loss of function mutations and, and eventually just disappear. And so the genes that you're actually, that are in the genome are the ones that survived and which means their immediate effect is advantageous or neutral and it goes to fixation and then subsequent mutations give neo-functionalization or sub-functionalization or escape from adaptive conflict um, these are particular mechanisms that make a, a new gene uh, basically important for the organism. And so um, it, it bases the, it, we come to this question of how do new parts get incrementally added to a complex adaptive system? And so I have a computational model that illustrates uh, how selection on gene origins will give you actually very special genotype phenotype maps. And this is an adaptation of Kaufman's NK landscape model, which we heard earlier. And so the idea here is you have a genome, and this gene will affect some certain subset of the organismal functions. And if this gene mutates, then basically it resamples the functional effect from a, a uniform distribution, independently of what it was. So that's called the house of cars mut mutation model. And so now we add a new gene. And it has some randomly chosen effect on this subset of functions. And we ask, uh, what happens if the new gene is only kept when it increases fitness? 
what happens to the distribution of the functions that it affects. And so the fitness of the organism is just the average of these five values on, on the genome X. And so uh, here's our genome growth algorithm. So we add a new gene to the genome. We obtain its functional effects randomly from a distribution. If it produces a fitness decrease, you throw it away. And if it produces a fitness increase, you keep it and then adapt the genome through allelic substitution to a fitness peak. So these are some of the dynamical assumptions, uh, strong selection, weak mutation, and here's what we get from the model. So here's our, when we create our new de novo genes, this is our, dist reflects the distribution of effects on the different functions uh, that we're drawing from. But when you look at the genes that are actually kept by evolution, you start out uh, just randomly accepting them, but as adaptation gets higher and higher, you, you get selection for fewer and fewer connections to the functions, for more sparsity. And um, so uh, if you look at the distribution, so this is the, you can call this the pleiotropy. So the number of different functions it's affecting is the pleiotropy. And if you look at the average pleiotropy, it starts out 20, which is the sampling distribution, but as the genome grows, it gets smaller and smaller. And so you're getting a more and more modular genotype phenotype map. And here's the actual distribution of pleiotropies. So this is the sample that we're, when our, each new gene is added to the genome, this is what we're, the, the sampling distribution. But when you look at the genes that are actually kept by evolution, as the gene number gets up, the, the concentration goes, gets more and more focused on genes that have very sparse effects. And again, so instead of getting this omnigenic genotype phenotype map where every gene affects every function, you're getting uh, much more concentration um, uh, uh, of uh, function on a, small, uh, on a small, every gene later in the genome growth affects fewer and fewer functions. So, but the, the effects on the adaptive landscape go even to a deeper uh, um, level and what we can do is we can take the outcomes of these, take the fitness landscapes that we've evolved and reinitialize them and look at, actually look at the attractor landscape, the, the attractor distribution. And so here, if we, we reinitialize the genome and let it evolve on this landscape, and then we look at the fitness of the attractor where it ended up at the fitness peak, we see that these landscapes that evolved through this process of selective genome growth have vastly higher fitness peaks than what we would get from a generic landscape with the same pleiotropy model. And we also see these very large domains of attraction uh, compared to these, which are, which are very small. So the process of conditioning uh, the genes in the genome on the fact uh, that they had to produce a fitness, infect, effect, fitness increase when they were added has profound effects on the adaptive landscape. So, all of these models uh, need to be refined, obviously, with greater population dynamic realism to make the of interest to population geneticists, but I think the basic phenomena will remain that the selective filtering of genes as they come into being should enrich the genome with genes whose variation is channeled towards adaptive opportunity, and that this may make the genotype phenotype map more interpretable. So let me conclude. So this is a, a cursory survey here, but I think it's enough to suggest phenomenology that should be explored. So the interpretability of biological systems or artificially evolved systems may itself be an outcome of different evolutionary dynamics. So evolution on neutral networks, constructive neutral evolution, and uh, the generic properties of dynamical systems, dimension reduction, diverse processes producing modularity and gene origins filtering for modularity, and other processes that need to be added to this catalog, I think all uh, may shape the extent of interpretability of evolved products of, uh, of evolution. And to finally conclude, it's an open problem of how to combine these different phenomena that enhance or thwart interpretability in biological systems. And that experience with evolutionary computation tells us to prepare at least for the possibility that the generative properties of the genotype phenotype map of evolved organisms may in some cases be intrinsically incomprehensible.
And instead, what we may need to do is understand the processes that produced the incomprehensibility. And finally, to note that interpretability isn't everything. The computational models of incomprehensible phenotype generation may yet be feasible. So thank you for your attention, and I'll take any questions.